Cassiano looked at everything, but sometimes insight comes when you focus on just one thing, drawing it again and again to get to its very essence. For me, no one demonstrates this more clearly than the great 18th century artist and scientist, George Stubbs. His fixation on his principal subject, the horse, culminated in some of the most viscerally brilliant anatomical drawings the world has ever seen. So what was it that drew Stubbs to the subject that was going to preoccupy him for virtually his entire working life? Well, in the first place, I think it was simply money. He recognised that there was a great opportunity in mid-18th century England for a painter who could truly master the anatomy of this splendid animal, because the principal patrons of the time, the milords of Georgian England, were themselves fascinated by horses, by their breeding, by their racing, by riding them. And they wanted an artist who could paint their animals more accurately than any artist before. But as Stubbs became really involved in the subject, as he delved deeper and deeper into the anatomy of the horse, rather like Leonardo, he ended up discovering much more than he needed simply to paint the animal. In fact, he created one of the great artistic, scientific projects of investigation of the entire 18th century. Stubbs was truly a master of the equine form. His ability to capture the weight and grace and poise of the animal is thrillingly visible in this portrait. And it really is a portrait, not just a horse painting. Whistle jacket. A picture that glorifies the majestic animal against a boldly blank background. His genius in capturing this pose was a direct result of the scrupulous anatomical drawings he'd produced a few years earlier. Drawings that got him, quite literally, right inside the structure of his specialist subject. I think one of the most impressive things about Stubbs is the sheer obsessiveness with which he went about studying the anatomy of the horse. You have to imagine this. Here he is. He's a young provincial portrait painter, the son of a tanner from Liverpool. He's got very little money, but he's got this great ambition, these grand ideas. So he saves and he saves, all the while going about the drudgery of painting the faces of Lord What's-His-Name and Lady Whoever, until he's finally hoarded enough cash to take a whole year and a half of his life out to pursue pure research. This was unheard of at the time. He was taking a great risk with his career. So what does he do? He rents an isolated farmhouse in the middle of the countryside and he procures the carcasses of a number of dead horses and he begins to study them. He even erects a complicated series of winches and pulleys so that he can draw them in positions that they might have assumed in life. At times, he studies an individual carcass so deeply and for so long that the body rots and there's an incredible stench. The air is thick with flies. The carcass is seething with maggots. Talk about immersing yourself in your subject matter. Stubbs would take the animal apart stage by stage so that skin would give way to muscle, then the veins and nerves, and finally, the skeleton, all the while studying with a razor-sharp analytical eye. They're among the great hidden treasures of the Royal Academy, and they're great works of art in their quality of tone and line. But I also think they're apt symbols of Stubbs's muscular, totally unsentimental intelligence. Thinking about the horse, led him to redraw the bigger picture of world science. He was one of the first thinkers to see through the old biblical myth that man was created apart from the animals. And in Stubbs's Comparative Anatomy, a series of very late drawings, you can feel his intense curiosity about the similarities between the human skeleton, the tiger, and the humble chicken. If we're so different, you can sense him wondering, how come our structure has so much in common with theirs? He was asking the question that would soon force an answer from Charles Darwin in the shape of the theory of evolution.
Stubbs's project wasn't simply a byproduct of the English gentry's horse mania. It was absolutely in keeping with the European Enlightenment's drive for the rapid progress of all human knowledge. And not just knowledge about our own earthly planet. Since Galileo's Renaissance fascination with telescopes and astronomy, it was thought that to truly understand who we were, we had to explore the mysteries of the universe. This idea came to obsess another 18th century Englishman, the portrait painter John Russell. In 1764, Russell got his first chance to look at the moon through a telescope, and that was it. He never quite recovered from the experience. He drew a sketch of it, his first actual record of what he'd witnessed. But when he got his hands on two telescopes of his own, that was when his great project really began. Over a period of 20 years, he built up a series of incredibly detailed studies of the moon's surface. Looking through the telescope, transcribing, looking again. Often he'd stay up all through the night because that was when a particular part of the moonscape was clearest. The most monumental product of all his labors was this fantastic, beautiful drawing, really a huge work in colored pastels, which is five feet square. Russell was so meticulous in his approach that he even designed his own crayons to execute it. As far as he was concerned, his was to be the biggest and most accurate depiction of the moon's surface ever made. And so accurate is it that you could easily mistake it for a photograph at first glance. But if you think this is impressive, you should see the hidden stash of detailed sketches he did in preparation for it. Over 180 still exist, a couple of them bizarre flights of fancy, with an angel hovering against the lunar surface. But Russell was meticulous, making complex notes in a shorthand invented by Lord Byron. These drawings truly are a well-kept secret, but how much do they really tell us? I put the question to the man who recently attempted to launch a rocket, not to the moon, but to Mars, head of the Beagle 2 space mission. Professor Colin Pillinger. As Russell said, they were a, a snapshot in time of the moon. He used to uh, organize his days so that uh, he could observe at night, but he would only observe about 10 days of the month. And his, uh, you know, they're not so good as a, a historical record because he was particularly fascinated by uh, wow. painting only, uh, you know, the moon during the first quarter. But that's so that's was, fantastic, isn't it? That is fantastically detailed. You couldn't wish for something as good as that with a camera, almost. If you took a bit of time over it, do you think you could actually ident Absolutely identify Absolutely, no it? doubt you could identify the craters individually from these pictures. Yes, Gosh, another, one, another one. Another yeah, one. There would be absolutely no problem at all. You can see here where the moon is only 250,000 miles away with a six-inch telescope, which is what he used you could get extraordinarily detailed things. And you could imagine him presumably thinking, well, it would be nice to go there. That is just fantastic. It's again this picture of the, uh, the light formed on the limb of the moon, where you can see the deep shadows when you uh, get close to the edge. Do you think he would have been uh, keen to sign up for the Apollo project? Oh, undoubtedly, but he be, presumably would have been one of those people that uh, they probably would have wanted to take. Because in those days, you know, like when the voyages of Darwin, they didn't have a camera, so they would take an artist. Exactly. So Russell would have probably been enlisted for the Apollo program, you know, he'd have been on the fourth mission, you know, take him along to draw the craters. He would have been in heaven. He would have been definitely in heaven. I'm sorry, that's a pun, but... <laughs> Russell's lunar mission was, in its way, a parallel to Stubbs's intensive studies of the inside of the horse. Both were working painters with clients to satisfy. Both had a private obsession that preoccupied them in their spare hours for years on end. And what strikes me as most comparable about them is that they both seem to point the way to so much in the future of science and exploration.